Hi, this is David Vaughn with HIV.gov, and I have the absolute joy of being joined by Raif Darazi to talk all things CROI 2024. Raif, thank you so much for joining us, and if you could, please just introduce yourself for our viewers. Absolutely, and first of all, thank you so much for having me, David. I appreciate it. I am a host fitness expert for Plus Life, which is a TV show, and we do a ton of social media content as well to educate, reduce stigma, and just make having conversations around HIV normal. I create a bunch of content for YouTube as well, interviews, weekly news and vlogs, and I'm co-chair for the HOPE Collaboratory funded by the NIH to work with HIV cure research scientists in the US and globally, providing community feedback and also sharing their research. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much. And so um, let's jump right in. So uh, the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, also known as CROI, was held in Denver from March 3rd through the 6th. So uh, to get us started, can you just tell me a little bit about what came out during the conference that caught your attention? Well, first of all, I would say the long acting injectables and that um, studies, we made so many advancements in HIV treatments known as antiretroviral treatment or ART. And one of the bigger breakthroughs is injectable ARVs that are long acting, meaning you can have an injection once every two months. And now there's even one that's uh, once every six months. And so these are injected subcutaneously or just below the skin and they treat HIV just like our other medications so that we're undetectable and therefore untransmittable, which means we can no longer pass on HIV via sex. Um, and so one study showed efficacy and safety in adolescents, which is a big deal. We don't have a lot of information on these specific treatments on adolescents. So that was great. Also, a second study showed that participants were more likely to maintain viral suppression on the long acting injectables versus a daily oral pill. That has lots of great implications. And there could be many reasons for this, but some of the major hurdles associated that long, and long acting injectable addresses is those people who forget to take their pills, like myself sometimes, I'm ADHD, so I, <laughs> I have a lot of things going on. Um, there are people who are unhoused, maybe financially insecure, food insecure, drug use, mental health challenges, the list goes on. But this seems to tackle a lot of those issues. Yeah, so uh, before we kind of jump onto the uh, next topic, but related topic, right? You, you alluded to something there that this is all about choice, right? Like there is no one um, option that is gonna fit the needs of every single person, right? Like just because you and I are two men living with HIV does not mean that the same treatment regimen is gonna work for both of us, right? Like one pill a day may not work as well for you. Whereas for me, like I, I love that structure, right? Like every morning I know I wake up, have my glass of water, have my pill, and then I head off to the gym, right? And so like for me right now, this works, but then also people's circumstances change. So again, it is it's about choice. Um, so that way people can choose the options that are, are right for them. Exactly. And I just want to emphasize that as well, too. Like there is a progression in the new developments of treatment that we have available, but that doesn't mean that the latest and greatest is the best for everyone. Like you said, we're just adding to this toolkit of options that we can choose from based on our, our on our needs. Yeah. Great. So talking about um, or sticking with treatment. Um, so on the last day at the conference, um, HIV.gov had the opportunity to talk to um, Dr. Carl Diefenbach, um, Director of AIDS at NIAID. And he talked about um, a study um, that was a phase two trial researching an oral once a week regimen. And I know that caught your attention because I saw you posted it on social media. So, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this just piggybacks perfectly off of what we're talking about now. And it's this, um, pill that's can be taken once every week potentially and people might watching might think well what, what's what's the point of that we already have the injectables um, for longer duration so why do we care about a weekly pill um, where does that fit in um, so I guess my my response to that would be just like all medications not everyone can handle all medications and that's why we have different options there might be for example some side effects that people get to the injectables they're not able to tolerate it as well um, for whatever reason or the hassle of simply making an appointment and going to a clinic to get an injection once every two months or six months. For me, that's kind of a lot with my schedule. I enjoy taking um, a daily pill versus going to the doctor every two months. And then there's also the issue where some people um, just value privacy and going to a clinic, the optics of that may not be safe for them in all their settings or it just might not be a preference. Um, I take so many pills personally for bodybuilding and for, fit, for fitness every day 
it's it's literally just a part of my routine no sweat off my back literally um <laughs> and <laughs> notably while this option um may not come to market for another three to five years um, it just it highlights the amount of work and research that is continuously being done behind the scenes that so many of us in the community aren't even aware of that are there to provide more options for us. So the last thing I want to talk about is something um, that caught a little bit of attention um, at the conference. And so one of the findings was a study about um, whether early initiation of ART may limit the establishment of HIV reservoirs, newborns, um, potentially enabling ART-free remission. So my first question is, what are HIV reservoirs? Yes, complicated topic. I am not a doctor or a scientist, but I will do my best as a lay person to, to kind of explain it. Uh, latent reservoirs are places in the body, namely cells and tissue where HIV hides and is inactive or essentially sleeping. This inactive HIV embedded in cells is invisible to modern HIV treatment and therefore remains in the body, even for those on effective treatment. So even though I'm U, U equals U, I'm under effective treatment, I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm living my life, there is HIV in my body in these latent reservoirs where um, HIV or the treatment can't reach them. And so notable is even though the virus is essentially asleep, hibernating, um, research has shown that this reservoir is releasing proteins and non-viable RNA or, or virus that isn't replicating or able to actually do anything to us directly. However, our body's immune system does recognize that these particles shouldn't be there and will send its white blood cells to attack and get rid of it. And this process causes inflammation in our body. It's chronic inflammation that happens in our body on a day-to-day -day basis. And the implications of this chronic inflammation is kind of unknown. We kind of have hypotheses, but for those of us who are continuing to live long, healthy lives with, with HIV and live longer, um, this chronic inflammation is something that we need to research more and be able to tackle and address. That's one of the reasons why latent reservoirs are so important. The other is that that is the key to unlocking cure as well. And I'm glad you said, um, you know, a lot more research is needed, right? When when we spoke with Dr. Prasad at Croy, you know, she cautioned like, you know, a lot more research and evidence is needed um, before this type of treatment can move anywhere near to being outside of, of strictly monitored clinical trials. So again, it's just another example of research that is very, very early, um, but could, could potentially have big implications for, for, for the community. So I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on the community need for involvement in, in research. Yeah, I mean, it's you said it perfectly. It's the Denver principles, nothing about us without us. And, you know, we, we are the very community that these researchers and scientists are seeking to help. So it makes sense that we have a seat at the table. And, you know, if we don't have a seat at the table, grab a chair and make one. Uh, that's, that's, my, that's my role as an advocate. And so I think it's so important because researchers and scientists don't necessarily know what our needs are on a day-to-day -day basis. It might not have anything to do with the medication itself, but it might have to do with the rest of our life. And there is a complex intersection of all the needs in our lives and how that affects our ability to, to take medication, to adhere to it, or even to be able to trust that this medication is going to help us and trust the people behind the medication. So having this conversation, having that transparency there, including us in the process, will just increase the chances that when something does come to market, a treatment or, you know, um, Godspeed, a cure one day, that um, the community is ready and willing to accept it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I really appreciate it. Um, and I look forward to um, speaking with you again. It's exciting stuff. We'll see you next time.